I want to share a word on the one thing that is hindering our finances. I've, we've talked about giving. We've talked about faith. We've talked about prophetic economy. But I want to deal with something. And this will not just touch your finances exclusively, but really your gifting, your calling, every part of your life. I want to talk about stewardship tonight. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Genesis 39. <clears throat> this is going to be our text. Genesis 39. While you're turning, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. It's alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, Lord, anoint my lips of clay to speak as the oracle of God tonight to help your people. I thank you, God, that you are loosing people from every tie that binds them. I thank you that your word is true and every demon is a liar. And I pray for the truth of your word to permeate every part of our lives right now. In Jesus' mighty name and all the people of God said, amen. Genesis 39 verses 2 through 5. It said, and the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper. I want you to take notice that the Lord caused all he did to prosper. And the Bible said, so Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he owned, he put in his charge. It came that <clears throat> about that from the time he made him overseer of his house and over all that he owned, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and the field. Now we know that Joseph went upon a journey. How many of you understand that Joseph had a destiny, but the destiny created a dilemma? Come on, I need you to talk to me. Joseph had a destiny, but the destiny created a dilemma. This is where we misunderstand prophecy. We come to ATL Hub or we go to a conference or we go to a gathering and somebody prophesies and says, uh, Ricky, you're going to the nations. But what they don't tell us is before you get there, you're going to be betrayed. Before you get there, you're going to lose some money. Before you get there, it's going to feel like you're losing your mind. Before you get there, you're going to go through some stuff. Uh, they don't tell us that part, but we're destined and he sometimes comes dilemmas and so Joseph had a dilemma but let's understand this in the middle of a dilemma Joseph kept his passion I need to tell people about your finances and your life and your calling that a dilemma does not derail destiny let me say it again. A dilemma does not derail destiny. Have any of you been going through life and something popped up you never thought would pop up Come on, somebody help me on Facebook, YouTube. Just say, that's me. And let us know if you're a replay. If you're aware, are you watching it from? And put hashtag replay in your comment. But something popped up. We were on the way to start that business, and something popped up. We were on the way to launch that ministry, and something popped up. We were on the way to move to that city where we felt like God told us to move to, and something popped up. In that time of something popping up, it is... there. there there is a determining factor to how we get out on the other side, and it's called faithfulness. We've got to be faithful to what God said in spite of what the enemy is doing. And some of us tonight and those on the replay, we're going through stuff we don't understand. Let me help you. Well, Ryan, I don't deserve this. Let me help you. Jesus said in this world, in this current system, in this current age, you're going to have tribulation. Tribulation is not exclusive for the unchurched. Come on. I say tribulation is not exclusive. Well, I shouldn't have to go through this. You're right. You shouldn't. But thanks be unto God. Come on. God is delivering you. God is strengthening you. And so Joseph persevered. But watch this. What they could not strip from Joseph when they stripped him of his identity and stripped him of his family and sold him into slavery. They could not strip destiny. Here's the thing I found out about provision. Provision is attracted to vision. We think, well, I can start that business once I get enough money. Sometimes God says, I'm not waiting for you to have enough money. I'm waiting for you to have enough vision. And vision will command provision to come. 
We think, well, I'll start that ministry assignment uh, when I get in. A, I, I really began to sense in my prayer time the other day. I don't know who this is for, but I want to throw this out prophetically. I began to sense that uh, God was going to begin to speak to people and deal with people about purchasing. Now, hear what I'm going to say, because we, we believe in for houses that all y'all would own houses and all y'all on Facebook and YouTube would own houses. But I'm moving beyond that and saying something prophetically. I began to sense that people of God were going to begin to get vision for for multiple houses to house people in crisis and calamity and destruction and trouble that God was going to be leading people and you may say look I got no money my credit is bad I don't know how this is going to happen but I want to tell you if you've got a vision God will bring provision to you God will cause millions to find you if you simply got a vision and in spite of them stripping his coat off of him selling him into slavery they could not not take Joseph's identity and now Joseph is in a house and God is with them and because God is with them there's a difference you've been put in the earth to make a kingdom difference some of you are praying God deliver me from this job and God said this job is the catalyst for your next because I'm going to teach you some things in this job you're not going to learn coming on Sunday night I'm going to teach you some things in this space I was speaking with somebody whose life has massively shifted the trajectory of their life and they said Ryan I'm learning industry I understood church but I did not understand industry how to function in certain spheres of the economy me. Listen, some of you, God wants to add another zero onto your net worth, but God's got to take you to a place called training. Joseph had to go through training, and he was put in the life of this Egyptian leader to make a kingdom difference. Watch this. The leader didn't get saved. I mean, people were not saved at that time. It was the old code. But the leader did not call on Yahweh. The leader didn't change his whole understanding of who God was. What the leader did is acknowledge God in the life of Joseph. And some of you are going to be working alongside of Buddhists and Muslims and atheists. And they're going to say, I don't understand your God, but I see the hand of the Lord on you. And I'm going to give you some of my money to invest. I'm going to promote you. I'm going to call, put you over here because there's something on you. You are being put in industries and positions and spaces and places to make a kingdom difference because this is the difference between us in the world when the world gets wealth they spend it on the world but when kingdom people get wealth we make a difference in the world for the kingdom of God we become a testimony for God and God wants to bring you to a place of elevated function so Joseph was there to make a kingdom difference the Bible said Joseph found favor favor will be your springboard you need to understand trial can't take your favor you can lose everything you have, and if you've got favor, you can rebuild. You can lose every person in your life. You can lose every financial possession. You can lose, uh, you can even lose your mind and get it back. Because if favor is on you, you can get it back. And even though they stripped Joseph, he had favor, and favor was still working. This is the thing I need you to understand economically, because we're going somewhere tonight. That favor will open doors for you that your education will not open. Favor will open doors for you that relationships will not open one of the things that bothers me so much about the the preachers i see coming up in this hour is they're such networkers and so they get to places god did not put them but their social media skills or their networking or their ability to get attention put them in that place and they're not ready for it and they become a bad testimony and a bad witness but the thing about favor is favor will work on you in the midst of your process of development Joseph found favor and he was positioned what doesn't work for others is going to work for you don't let people say, oh, that won't work. I remember sitting in the back room of a large conference, and the leader of the conference said, Ryan, I want to talk to you. This hubs thing, it won't work. I said, why? People don't understand that. You just need to call it church. I said, Jesus said hub. 
He didn't say church to me. I understand church. I love church. I've been a member of a church. I build churches. I'm going to keep on building churches. But Jesus said this thing that we're going to build is going to be beyond just a church. It's going to be a hub. It's going to be a center. It's going to be an epicenter, a gathering place. The, the thing in the center of the wheel with spokes going out and the prophetic and the apostolic and the evangelistic and nations and prayer. This is what Jesus, but it won't work because people don't understand. Sometimes mystery works in your favor. Folk will come to see things they don't understand. I don't understand certain things. In fact, when some people try to explain things to me, I say, I don't need to understand that. If you know how to do it and you're doing it and I need it done, I really don't need to be educated on the process of it. I just need you to do it. I don't need you to tell me how the engine in the car works. I don't need to do, I don't need to know that. I just need to make sure you can fix it if it's not working and give me the bill so I can pay it. I don't need you to tell me how quantum physics works. I just need it when it's working in my life. I need to know it's there. I don't need you to tell me how that medication kills this, 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 this. I don't need to understand. I just need to know if it works effectively. God is going to take you to spaces and places of favor. The Lord's going to cause what's in your hand to prosper. Watch this now. We are such a generation that it thinks we're missing something. FOMO. We're missing. We're worried about our peace. There's this whole debate. I was sitting with the pastor the other day, and they said this whole debate about 10% is so aggravating because we shouldn't even be focused on 10%. Like that should be the minimum of what we give to the Lord. But we're trying to figure out our peace. Well, how much can I get away with not giving to God? If you tithe and you do to the penny, like $112.03, you need deliverance from legalism and stinginess. Round that thing up. But we want to try to figure out the bare minimum of what we can do. The bare minimum of what we can give. We want to figure out why don't I have a piece as big as this person's piece. But here's the mystery of the life of Joseph. They stripped him from everything. And God just kept giving him favor after favor after favor after favor. And those in the world saw the hand of God on his life and said, when we put you in charge, God shows up. And God is going to be that way in your life economically. That when you put God in charge, God will put you in charge. And when you're in charge, you are God is going to show up for you. But the question is, what's in your hand? The Lord caused what was in Joseph's hand to prosper. Many of us have complained so much about what we don't have that we failed to maximize what we do have. How many of us are so frustrated about where we aren't? Well, you know, I, I, I'm 47, and I just thought by this season in my life, you know, the prophecies I got when I was five, did I be going to nation? I hadn't been to no nation. Da, da, da. Look, God could touch you at 79, baby. And it, you're like, whoo, I got a second win. I'm 80 and going to Africa and going here and going there and going there. You, you laugh, but God could do it. Well, I just don't understand. You know, I started this business and it failed. God could give you a new business tomorrow morning if you keep your heart right. What's in your hand? See, the, here's the deception of the enemy. We are so focused on what we don't have that we are minimizing our present and we are failing to maximize the gift of God in our life today. And we become a people that say, well, when I get more, I'll do more. When I get more, I'll give more. No, if you're stingy making $100 a week, you're going to be stingy making $1,000 a week. If you're stingy making $1,000 a week, you're going to be stingy making $10,000 a week. If you're stingy, you're just stingy. It has nothing to do with what you have or what you don't have because there's some little grandmas that go to their church and, and bundle up their change and put in the offering because they are generous givers and there's some people of God that are stingy because we're afraid we're going to lose what's in our hand. But God said, when you release what's in your hand I'm going to release what's in my hand Joseph what's in your hand he caused it to prosper one of the key differences between the rich and the poor is savings and investment see we think well if I get that better job and get this because if you don't learn the art of stewardship you're going to struggle with more money you're just going to have better stuff you're struggling with you're struggling with a better car you're struggling in a bigger house, but you're still struggling because you haven't learned stewardship. And this is why people that steward wealth have the understanding of investment. They understand, I'm working today so that I can get where I want to get to tomorrow. 
One of the issues that we face, though, and one of the things that frustrates us, I think, uh, in America, and I know we have people online, is that we have this huge wealth gap, right? Because I don't want to give you the good stuff without giving you the reality stuff as well because this is why we need the difference maker in our life because there's some things stacked against us. There was a study done this year in 2022 and it found this, that three billionaires in America own more wealth than the bottom half of Americans. Three men own more than 50% of Americans. Three men own more than 160 million Americans. Today in 2022, 45% of all new income goes to the top 1%. CEOs of large corporations make a record-breaking 350 times more than their workers earn. Why do I need God in my finances? Because this thing's stacked against me. Think about that. The CEO is making 350 times more than the other people in the organization. Why might I need to be more entrepreneurial? Why might I need to believe God? Why does the church need to talk about money? Because we don't need to keep having bake sales and pie auctions. And, you know, I remember they used to do this thing, the first church I pastored. Well, uh, people will pay. You know, it's funny, pastor. People throw pies in the leader's face. And I let them do it one time. I said, the devil is a liar. You're not throwing no more pies in my face. I don't care. We won't go on the mission trip. Come on, we won't go there. If God's people would just give and be faithful stewards, God would increase them. But we have some things stacked against them, right? Um, I found this study, and this was done a little while ago, so some of these figures are not current. This is a study in America, and it found this. This is a study on racial wealth gaps. And people say, well, why are people complaining today in 2022 about racial inequality? Well, let me help you to understand this. The average net worth per capita amongst white Americans is roughly $437,000. This was a study a little while ago. Whereas the value, um, uh, let me see, uh, uh, African Americans, uh, their, their average net worth is $105,000 in America. And for Hispanics in America, their average net worth at the time of this study, net worth was $53,000 in America. That's America. Now, a few years ago, there was a study conducted in Atlanta. You know, Atlanta proper has 52% african-american inhabitants and so we see entrepreneurs and business people and black businesses and black wealth in atlanta and celebrate but not everybody is doing well in atlanta well why are we talking about this in church because we're learning look you can't work a system you don't understand and here's the problem we just want to pray and speak in tongues but not know what we're up against we have to understand these things so we can get where we need to go, amen? And so there was an analysis conducted in Atlanta by race, and here's what it found. And these numbers are more now. This was several years old, but I could not find the updated one. It found that the median white household income at the time of this study was $83,722. Okay? But the same study for black families in Atlanta was $28,105. So in one of the blackest cities in America, there is a huge gap. And why do we need to understand this to know we need God to help us make the difference, right? We need God to help us overcome. We need God to help bring us out, and he's going to bring us out. So we need to understand that there's wealth inequality, that the system is stacked against us. Why is the tax code this big? Because wealthy people can hire somebody to go through that tax code and figure out we have billionaires in America that don't ever pay taxes, some that have been our political leaders never pay no taxes. Billions of dollars. And then we got folk making $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 a year, barely surviving, and they're out there getting slammed with the tax bill. And then we get excited about a tax rebate. God wants to elevate you where you're not excited about a tax rebate because you're stocking up money in the bank and getting ready for what the Lord wants to do in your life. Amen? So God said, Joseph, what's in your hand? I want to say to some of you out there and some of you in here, what's in your hand? Because here's the thing that stops your stewardship. When you say, well, I'm going to be a good steward when... 
I'm going to pray when I'm a full-time preacher. If you don't pray as a part-time preacher, you definitely ain't going to pray as a full-time preacher. I'm going to tithe when I really get to a good place in my income. Let me help you. If you won't tithe in the struggle, you won't tithe in the come up either. Pro Colossians 3.23 said, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. We've got to understand this, that God weighs the work of our hands. How are we working with what God gave us? Do you know that Jesus believes in productivity? I was watching a service recently, and it was powerful. It was really, really powerful, like what we experienced tonight. It was a conference. It was a gathering. It was powerful. People were falling out and prophesying. And this question went through my mind. This question was, I wonder what they're going to do when they get back up. Because I find we have this division in the church. We have people that love the presence of the Lord. They go to every prayer meeting, every gathering, every prophetic meeting. And, and, and they, they, I mean, they, they've been so filled with the Holy Spirit. But you put them in a bank and they'll make a fool of themselves. You get them out in government and they don't know how to talk to people. Because they're one-dimensional. And then what the church does is the church gets angry with people who start to actually impact out there. I was sitting in the back room. They said, we have this so-and-so. You know, they lost their anointing because they're dealing with rappers and business people. And I'm like, look, I've watched this man preach on Sunday and cast demons out. He's doing more than some of y'all do in your services. But because he's dealing with CEOs and business people and bankers, you all are getting offended. What would Jesus be doing? Jesus would be dealing with people in every mountain of society. And one of the reasons God wants to give the church influence is so we can be a difference maker. We need a Joseph anointing in this hour to know how to get where we're going. We need some entrepreneurs. We need some multitaskers. We need some people that are believing God so we can do what God called us to do and make a difference in the world. But the church will get so mad at people. I had a preacher friend of mine start slamming uh, some music people that I love. I almost said, uh, but so I wrote to him, said, I disagree with you. I'm not one that usually does this, but if I say it out there, I'm going to say it to you first. I don't understand you. I don't understand all the things you could talk about on your platform. You could talk about Jesus. You could talk about the resurrection. You could talk about the rapture if you want to. You could talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You could talk about I don't believe in the rapture. You could talk about whatever you want to talk about. And the most prolific thing you could think to talk about is to slam some worship leaders because you don't think they use their social media platform to say a certain thing that you think they should say. Since when did we start checking? Well, you got to say this and agree with this and agree with that and agree with this. Feels pretty pharisaical to me. And so, well, but I didn't agree. You know, they had a concert and the concession stand sold this and da 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 da. And I say, have you ever thought people are showing up that will never come in your church? That people that, that, that don't know God in any way are coming to hear songs about Jesus and his kingdom. And you don't, but we are so good at disqualifying people whose movement doesn't look the way we think it should look. And this is the thing Joseph did. Joseph was not dealing with the church. Joseph was dealing with the nation. And God's going to raise up some Josephs. I was in Croatia. And there's a young lady in Croatia because God gave me that nation years ago. I used to go preach there, Jay. I said, what's the the best thing I can do for your country and they said we've only got about 4% of people in this nation saved so if you could come over and have miracle crusades and get people saved that would be the best thing I said let's rent the biggest auditorium we can get in the capital city and let's put it on television and advertise it and so I began to go there every year and there was celebrities coming and soccer stars coming and the network television of the nation began to come and God began to give us that nation and give us favor and during that time there was a young lady that I began to prophesy to and her brother I said I'm I want to come to America I said come stay in my home and her brother stayed in my home then she stayed in the home but now she works for the Croatian government she's on one of the highest councils in the government and she said I'm giving them advice about our food that food needs to become national security that we need to make sure that our food supply is secured and I said you are a Joseph God 
has put a Joseph anointing upon your life. And I believe God is going to raise up some Josephs. But we've got to be good stewards. We can pray for increase. But if we don't steward what we have, we're not going to walk in the increase. Amen. Proverbs 12, 11 said, he who tills his land will have plenty of bread. But he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. I wonder how many of us have a vision to write a book, but we're too busy scrolling TikTok. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm researching, Apostle. I'm trying to, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I, look, I work with people. I stopped giving people advice on most things. Because I would get so frustrated. I would tell people, this is what I did, and this is how I did. This is how I wrote my book. This is how I marketed my book. Da, da, da. And they would do none of it and then come back and say, I'm so discouraged. This is the word of God for you, stewardship. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't say, he who loves God. You know you can love God and be poor. You know, you can love God and be prophetic, but never, ever get the opportunity to prophesy because you're late all the time. Because when someone hands you a microphone and says, take five minutes, you always take 15. You didn't have, we ask you to take 15. See, if you can't manage time, the first thing that tells me is you're undisciplined. Because if you can't manage my time, you don't manage your time. And therefore, if I put a microphone in your hand, you're going to mismanage the opportunity. We are all given the same 24 hours a day, and we need to maximize every single second of our time. And the Bible said, he who tills his land will have bread. Not he who loves God. He who loves God and doesn't till his land is not going to have it. Some of you think what's stopping your ministry is a lack of anointing, but actually it's a lack of character. <laughs> you have anointing, but you can't show up on time. You have anointing, but you can't serve. See, this is the thing about not serving. If you won't serve what is another man's vision, you won't effectively serve your own vision because you will have an attitude of entitlement where you think you deserve something. Listen, I remember one time I was getting an attitude and the Lord said this thing. He said, son, I want you to know you are replaceable in what you do for me. He said, just in a moment, when Saul wouldn't listen, I brought up a David. And I began to realize it's a privilege to work for the Lord. If I'm preaching to two people, if nobody shows up but two people, yeah, I might be discouraged, I might be frustrated, but it is a privilege. If I'm doing a live and only one viewer is on the live, I'm just going to pray. Oh, my dear, 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 Isaiah. oh, Josephine, I'm so glad you came on my live today. God has a word for you, Josephine. I'm just going to preach to you, Josephine. Why? Because because if I can't serve one, I can't serve 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000. And this is the thing. Where you're at right now in what's in your hand and how you manage what's in your hand now determines where you're going. And But we are living in a popcorn generation. We just want it quickly. Because we see other people get it quickly. Most people who get anything quickly lose it. Why do people that win the lottery end up poor in five years? Because they're overwhelmed. They don't know how to handle it. I remember preaching in this one place, and there was a bunch of people in this place. I don't want to give too much detail. But they had all joined in a lawsuit and sued the United States government and got a whole bunch of money. And they had cars parked in front of their house that looked 10 years old with holes in them and everything. And the man of God driving me around said, all them cars were new just a few years ago. But see, those new cars look like their old cars because what was in them manifested externally. And we get so frustrated with what's around us, but we don't deal with what's in us. We are creating externally what's internal. Well, I just feel like my family, you know, they're always causing drama. I, da, 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 da. I, you know, I feel like these girls I date, they're always, well, why do you keep dating them? Why do you keep giving people access to you? Well, I'm just so vexed, you know, every time my aunt comes, my aunt is criticizing me, but, da, 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 but you keep inviting her. 
So you have to be honest with yourself. Something inside of you is comforted by that because you're used to it. And that will prevent you from your next. Because one thing drama does, it occupies your mind, your spirit, and your body. So instead of focusing on the assignment God's given you, starting that business, getting that thing going, uh, beginning that ministry, writing that book, instead of focusing on that, you go, I'm mad at my family. I'm mad at this person. I'm mad at my girlfriend. I'm mad at this. And you're focused on all this other stuff. And then five years from you, I just don't understand why I can't get anywhere. It's not fair. You've got to change what's internal so you can change what's external. Stewardship, management, development, amen? Uh, the Lord will open for you his good storehouse, Deuteronomy says, the heavens to give rain to your land in its season and bless all the work of your hand. Why didn't it just say God would do it? Wait a minute, apostle, I just thought that God would do it. Mm-mm. God's going to do it as you're doing it. Isn't it amazing, Ms. Deneen, the sick usually aren't healed until we pray? He's God. Couldn't he just heal the sick without our prayer? God has limited his activity in earth to human partnership. So God doesn't just go around and go, oh, you know, I'm just going to go up and heal Ricky today. No, no, no. Somebody's prayer initiates the move of God. Somebody's faith initiates the move of God. Somebody's faithfulness initiates the move of God. God is God, but God said, I'm not going to go around God without people partnering with me. Why? Because the first thing God did is say, Adam, I'm giving you dominion. I'm giving you rulership over the... Well, that was Adam. But then Jesus came as the second Adam and stripped hell of a authority and stripped hell of power to restore power and authority to his chosen body the church that Ephesians declares is the fullness that means we lack nothing God is in us God is upon us God is with us the God of miracles the God of wonders the God of power we don't lack anything we are prolific we are powerful we are prophetic we are evangelistic we've got all power all authority because Jesus gave it to us but the thing stopping us is us it's us. Most churches, when they meet on Sundays or whenever they meet, they have no intention of letting God do a lot in their service. This is why I don't understand. One of my sons says, well, God puts prophets sometimes in places, you know, that are dry. I'm like, no, mm -mm. I decided in my life it was unfruitful to spend my time with other Christians trying to convince them of realities. I don't want to go. I'm frustrated on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm frustrated going through the drive through at Starbucks. I don't need to come to church and be frustrated at church. I don't want to be a prophet going to first church that don't believe in prophets. Come on. Ladies, you don't want to be a woman preacher and you're going to church. Well, we don't believe in women preachers. We let women testify. We let women pray, but we won't let them preach. And yet you know you're called to preach because this is the thing. It's the law of the soil that the same seed in different soil produces a different harvest. Some of you, there's nothing wrong internally. It's the soil you've been planting your life in. And you've got to be brave enough and bold enough to say, I'm going to get in a different set of soil where God is moving in my life. I don't have time to just be over here. Why? Because time is the investment we can't get back. And so... God's hand moves in sync with our movement. I know that's challenging your thinking, but I'm giving you scripture to back up what I'm saying. The Lord will open his storehouse, the heavens will give rain to your land, and bless all the work of your hand. Jesus cursed the fig tree. It wasn't producing fruit. In the parable of the talents, Jesus was upset with the person that did not properly invest their talent. Listen to me. Jesus was not upset with the size of his talent. Here's the deception. We think God is concerned with the size of our talent. If you have a prophetic anointing and your anointing works that when you're having coffee, you just feel, I just feel to pray for this lady. You don't get any details. You don't have any information. And then another brother walks and goes, oh, your name is Charmaine and you live on uh, 125 First Street. Then you just feel all defeated. Jesus is not concerned with the size of the talent. 
the parable of the talents was about faithfulness. So if the prophet that calls names and addresses is not faithful and does what God tells them to do, and you just, you, you don't have no names, no address, you just walk in and feel led to, I just feel led to pray for you. And that's the only gift you got, but you're faithful with that gift. You do everything God tells you with that gift. And, and thousands of people or hundreds of people or tens of people are impacted, but you did with God what God told you to do with that gift. When you get to heaven, you are going to get a reward based on your faithfulness, not the size of your gift. And we've got to quit thinking the reward is based on the size of our gift because the reward is not based on the size of your gift. This is what I'm trying to get some of you to see. God said, I will bless the work of your hand. You've got to put your hand to something. See, a dream without a plan is simply an imagination. But you've got to take the dream. I've got a dream to start this business. Where can you start? You may not be able to get all the way out here, but you could start down here on Monday that you begin. If all you do tomorrow is write a vision statement, write your vision statement. If that vision statement stays on your desk for five years and you pray over it, you are making progress in the realm of the spirit. But God cannot bless what you don't put your hand to. And this is the thing the devil does. The devil keeps us from putting our hands to something. Well, what if I put my hands to it and I fail? You learn. You learn. We all have, I want to talk about a few areas of stewardship and I'll be done. Number one is time. Everyone has the same 24 hours in a day. What we don't have, we don't all have the same number of, year, of years on earth. But do you understand some people live 40 years and impact multitudes of people? Other people live 95 years and we never know their name. So it's not relevant how many years you have. You, all of us have the same 24 hours in a day. And most of us are excusing our way out. Not excusing like excuse me. Excusing, which is not really a word. We're making excuses. Excusing our way out of destiny. I don't have time. I don't have time. Two things you need to do to clarify how much time you have. Number one, if you have a smartphone, you need to pull it out and look at how many hours a day you spend on that. There's some time. Number two, however you spend money and track money, you need to look at it and you need to say, where did my money go this week? Because if your money went to a movie, there's a good hour and a half to two hours you had. The devil will give you lots of excuses and you will be an old person filled with dreams that are unfulfilled because you never put your hand to something. Time. How do you steward your time? The second area of stewardship is study. Why? I said every destiny demands development. The greatest area of development is study. I'm amazed at the people who get prophecies about certain things and never buy a book about it. God told me I'm going to nations. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a prophet. How many books? It, well, I, you know, this is some deep. I don't read any books men write. I used to have a guy in my, in my church say, I don't read any books men write. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, so you never read the Bible? Oh, God inspired that. I said, who wrote it? Men. Scribed it down. And then men collected and decided which books would be in there. And there's controversy about it. some books maybe should have been in that aren't in there. Men wrote that book. And so what you're saying to me is you are so spiritual in a false sense that you permit the presence of ignorance because of spirituality. So God can't use you in nearly any area that requires wisdom because you've developed very little. And he was an unwise man, and, and I saw it in the process of his life. Study. We all have the same capacity to study. Well, wait a minute. I have a learning disability. Notice I didn't say we all have the same capacity to learn. We have different capacities to learn. Some people cannot read. There's a wonderful thing called audiobooks. One of the greatest investments you can make is magazines and blogs because basically people have taken tons of information and condensed it into a micro format and you can extrapolate it just like that. But we get all these prophecies, but we don't study. If you're not studying the thing you feel called to do, you are showing to God and to people your lack of respect for the thing you believe God called you to do. The third area of stewardship is finances. Really, finances are a reflection of our heart, right? Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what we love, we're going to spend money on. People spend money on different things. Some people 
loved their house. I've known people who drove very plain cars, dressed very plain, but had an amazing house. They said, I just love my house. I don't care about this other stuff. There are other people that they love other things. And so you can track their passion by their finances. We have stewardship over that. The, the next area of stewardship is spiritual gifts. Are you being a good steward over your gifts? Because here's what we think. Well, I just don't have that many. I bet you have more activated in you than you think. You know, the first gift that got activated in me was Nabi prophecy. That I would just be in atmospheres where God was, and I would feel something like a pot boiling inside of me, and I would just prophesy like that. I didn't see anything. I didn't have a lot of other stuff. I had that gift. Later, I had other gifts. I found the more I used the gifts that I had, the more God gave me other gifts. I began to get hungry for the word of knowledge. In fact, I began to get fascinated by the word of knowledge. I said, God, I want you to show me things about people. And I'd get every preacher that came that a word of knowledge gift. I'd say, lay hands on me. Pray for me. Even if they weren't doing it, if they were calling for back pain, I didn't have back pain, I'd go get in the prayer line just so they laid hands on me. Because I wanted that gift. And what happened was I began to operate in that gift. Now, when I first started operating that gift, I didn't know everything. Sometimes I would have one word, two words, but as I gave the one word, the two words, the three words, guess what? God would give me more, and God would give me more, and God would give me more. So how you steward your spiritual gifts will impact the development and growth of their gifts. And the last area of stewardship I want to mention is service. <clears throat> how are you serving in the kingdom of God? How effective is your service? Is your service effective? Can people trust you for kingdom assignments? Well, you know, if I get to preach, I'll show up, I'll be well said. What if you're working the product table? What if you're helping people park their cars? Can people trust you with kingdom assignments? How is your serving? Because this is the thing. As God elevates you, he's elevating you to serve. If God elevates you in the area of education, he's elevating you to serve people. I remember uh, some time ago, I had a family member that was in the hospital. And I went into the, the emergency room of a major city. And people were lined up out the door. And the lady at the desk had the worst attitude I've ever seen on a human being. And I wanted to say, lady, we're in the emergency room. Nobody wants to be here. But somewhere in your life, you decided to work in the medical industry and to serve people. I know she was frustrated. But what she was creating in that chaotic environment increased the level of chaos. She was not serving well. And then when I got past that lady, I got to a nurse. And the nurse was the sweetest lady I had seen in a long time. And the nurse was serving well and she changed the atmosphere and the environment because she was serving well how are you serving in the kingdom of God and I'm not saying in the church I'm saying in the kingdom of God if can you be trusted can somebody say here's the keys to my house I'm leaving for six months when they come back are your dirty socks everywhere one thing I hate is when people borrow my car, and I've had people, spiritual family and different people, borrow my car, take my car for two weeks, a week and a half, and it comes back, looks like it's been drugged through the mud, and I gave it to them with three quarters of tank on gas, and now I got an eighth of tank of gas. Well, I just didn't have time. You had time to get it dirty? You had time to run the gas out. You had time to drive everywhere else. Watch this. How? Well, I, I don't understand why I don't have a better car. Maybe because you're not ready for it. We had this little car when we started traveling the ministry, a little two-door Honda Civic, and we were traveling. Uh, Joy and I, our son, and the lady that was helping us with our son at that time because he was like four. And we were cramming into this two-door little car. And every time, and y'all have heard me tell the story, I would just complain and complain and complain. And a lady preacher said to me, Ryan, whatever you bless increases and whatever you curse decreases. She said, you need to begin to bless that car. Well, I didn't want to bless that car because in my mind, that car was insufficient for my assignment. But the revelation of stewardship is if I don't take well care of what I have, 
I'm not qualified to receive more. So I began to bless that car. Literally, I began to get in the car. Father, I thank you for this car. It's a blessing to us. Thank you that it's getting us where we're going. And Lord, I thank you for a van. I thank you for a van to travel and preach the gospel and that it's a debt-free van that you're causing it to come into our hands. And I began to bless that car. I was preaching in 1999. A woman jumped up, said, I have a word. The pastor said, that's the proverb of the house. Let her give the word of the Lord. She said, God said, you've been praying for a van. And, and I, sh I didn't know this woman. Never met her before. Have not seen her since. People started running from all over this, you know, before cash up and, and just throwing money on the altar. There was thousands and thousands of dollars on that altar. When we began to bless what God put on our hands, what was in our hands began to increase.